Hey, hey, this is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. Today I'm here with Che Sharma, who's the CEO and founder at Epo. Hey, Che. Hey, great to be here, Carlos. Thanks for having me. Happy to have you on the show. And I was taking a look at your background before this interview. Was, uh, I don't get across many data scientists that turn into CEOs. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'd like to learn a bit more about that part of you before we jump into your current company. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, as you said, my background is in data science. Most of that time I was at Airbnb, where I was the fourth data scientist. So quite early on, stayed there for about five years and then worked as an early data scientist at other growth companies. Um, you know, the transition to CEO was honestly out of a desire to, uh, you know, build better tools for data teams. So, you know, for, in that regard, it's a pretty natural transition to be, you know, the practicing the sort of thing that you're building for. Um, you know, saw just that. for anyone who's been in the data space and or adjacent to it, there's been huge secular trends in how people do analytics work with the rise of the modern data stack. And that just implies that we need a different set of tools for the way people work today. And here's the interesting thing that I've seen from, from my perspective working in product. Those tools used to be for the data teams and the engineers. You had to be some, 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 somewhat technical. To, mm -hmm. to get value out of those tools. And a lot of them are becoming much more visual. And we are seeing marketers, product people, other stakeholders using them. So I just want to learn more about that. Guys, what is your angle and how do you see the opportunity to create a tool that is so flexible enough for other people so the data, the data team doesn't become a bottleneck? Yeah, completely. So, I mean, the, the way the trends have gone is that you know, it started off by you just have the basic ability to deal with large volumes of data. You know, the birth of the internet and cloud infrastructure meant large amounts of data. And then you had the basics of distributed compute with Hadoop uh, to be able to do anything at all. Now, the problem was to do anything at all still required a bunch of DevOps chops, data engineering skills, you know, scientist skills, and then uh, evangelism skills. And so you ended up with these kind of full stack data scientists were the only ones who could use it. But just the the different parts of the supply chain have just gotten so much easier. You know, now you don't have to run your own Hadoop cluster. You can just get Snowflake and it's all quite easy. You know, orchestrating jobs used to be, you know, we literally had to build Airflow, Airbnb. Now there's DBT and other tools that make it easy. And so you actually now have the ability to build a tool stack. You know, you didn't have to start from the ground up, which I think has led to all these great other tools come in. And I, th I think one of the big things is so many of these capabilities used to exist in-house at places like Airbnb, um, but now that they're turning into actual companies, they're getting front-end resources and designers and you know, self-serve becomes a lot more possible. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Uh, you obviously, you, you, I feel that passion. You've been definitely part of the problem as a data scientist for different companies. So how did you experience that old, old school way of building data stacks and how did you arrive to the the solution that you're building today with Apple? Yeah, completely. So uh, again, my, my most formative data science career was at Airbnb, where we started off, and you know we started off with just MySQL replicas and cron tabs, which you know for anyone who deals with data infra, that's not not a great place to scale a practice. Uh, we eventually adopted Hive, which is a way to kind of run large jobs, um, and then we built Airflow to manage it. The but along the way, you know, the story I always like to tell is the thing about Airbnb in comparison with other companies is it was founded by designers, right? And so it wasn't founded by people who are like naturally data quantitative people. It was founded by people who are much closer to a Steve Jobs, Walt Disney approach of, you know, intuition and design. And so as a data team, even while we're spinning up all this infra, we also had to like drive impact in a way that would win over the orc. You know, we didn't just come in with a halo that we can kind of win arguments. And so the thing that always struck me was that, you know, we did a lot of great things at Airbnb, but the thing that made the data team into what it is today, which is probably one of the most sophisticated orgs, you know, on the planet, was the experimentation infrastructure. You know, AB experiments is this kind of fascinating workflow that let that builds this intimacy with metrics where like, you know, you don't have to know things about ETL and databases and stuff like that. Instead, you just know this fairly simple paradigm, you know, probably been doing it since the fifth grade, you know, dividing people into two groups randomly, 
you know, having one group do one thing, the other do another and see who does better and just kind of engaging with science without having to know all the ETLR data. Um, and that ended up being a huge fit for Airbnb. You know, Airbnb was such an entrepreneurial place. So the idea of like, you know, being able to prove the quality of ideas without political processes, that was a great fit. Um, and we ended up, you know, seeing some incredible impact during those years, you know, I would say right around 2014, 2016, there were some like huge changes coming from, you know, small interventions and large interventions. It was, it was an incredible moment. And I remember those moments because this concept of A-B testing was really revolutionary. And there were pioneers like Airbnb that made that tangible for the non-technical mm -hmm. user. I remember the first time I was uh, exposed to an A-B test and I was able to just literally tweak a couple of variations, put them in market within within minutes and then start getting insights and then making decisions on that. Um, now today we see in product management, uh, A-B testing or experimentation is a huge um, component. It's a huge skill that is being required mm -hmm. in interviews. So from your perspective, like how much knowledge in experimentation or A-B testing you expect from a PM in order to be mm -hmm. successful? Yeah, you know, this is a big point of passion because, you know, if you consider the state of tooling uh, for most of history, you know, the, the assumed knowledge of a PM is actually quite high. You know, there's a lot of ways you can shoot yourself in the foot with an experiment, not tracking enough data, uh, having biased data, having improper setups, using the wrong, using statistics improperly. And these tools never really, like, helped you there. You know, they, they, they were happy to let you set up experiments and give you you know, positive, negative results, but never, you know, never quite trusted them. Um, and I think that leads to a lot of situations that you see today, which is that if you want to be a PM running AB experiments, you purchase some third party tool for hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then you still have to hire some data scientists who are actually going to give you trustworthy results. And so that was really a big part of what led to EPO being built was to say, how can you have something like really trustworthy as if you had a data scientist, you know, pulling data from the warehouse, giving you the ability to storytell, to root cause, um, and to socialize, um, all while being reliable. So, you know, the answer is up until EPO, I would say, you know, PM would be responsible for knowing, you know, data lifecycle and statistics. But with EPO, you basically just need to understand the scientific process, you know, like what do you want to learn? What is the best way to learn it? Um, you know, what, what are you looking for? So, so what are some of those best practices for PMs to collaborate effectively with data scientists and vice versa? Definitely. So this is something that, uh, you know, I felt on both sides of the aisle, both as a data person, as a PM, the, uh, there's a kind of startup cost of just making sure your data house is in order. Um, so it, it's worth your org having like at least one or two data people just to see like, you know, do you trust your metrics? When you say you're counting the number of purchases, is it a good number of the number of purchases? So like, you know, if you're running an experiment that's meant to increase revenue, increase purchases, is the underlying data actually high quality or not? So I would say that there's a startup cost, which is just, do you actually trust your metrics? Um, once you have that, then I think it, their interaction with the PM and the data team becomes, do you have what you need to root cause things? For example, you have a purchase, Are you, do you know like the marketing channel they came in on or the subscription tier they're on or the device they're on at that moment? Like the sort of things that might be explanatory for like why a certain conversion happened or did not or why some effects are happening or not, like making sure those are all in place. So basically making sure you're well instrumented and that you trust your underlying data. Like that's something that a data and PM, data person in the PM should invest in early and make sure you're in a good state there. Because like, you know, instrumentation is something where once it goes out there in the world and you did not instrument it, you can't go back in time and get it. You have to do it all up front. And I, I agree, I've seen this evolution in, in product tech in general, but specifically with data tools, where a lot of companies start with a spreadsheet, literally just putting numbers and creating formulas. And then suddenly they have these elaborate architectures with a bunch yeah. of different tools to a point that it's, not, it's also unclear, right? Like what pool to use, who to ask, and then yeah, yeah. why did we get here? And um, there's a lot of tools out there in the market and uh, 
examples. Uh, some of those companies are public today. That's, I mean, there's clearly value, but at the same time, there is this confusion. So I'm hoping you can help us identify, like, as from a product team perspective, what are some of those key layers for for you know, to have a data stack, and and how do you see Apple kind of positioning uh, in the whole stack? Completely. So lately, as in in the past five years, you've seen a huge consolidation onto a common stack. So the good news is there's basically a right answer now. Um, mo if you look at any sort of growth stage company, so post product market fit, and even earlier, you'll see this data warehouse model. Uh, basically, there's a big three of databases, Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, that almost every company uses. You know, my favorite of the three is Snowflake for a variety of reasons. Um, and then what you do is a lot of different SaaS tools will out of the box write to Snowflake. If not, then you need some sort of tool like a, an ETL tool, like a segment in Fivetran to get it into Snowflake. And then uh, once your data team is in place, you can bring on a DBT to actually calculate what you need. So when we say the modern data stack, you're basically talking about Snowflake with DBT on top um, with some tools to get the data into there. And the benefit of that is that, you know, the most trusted metrics are usually pulling from a few different data sources. So for example, your event data might not be very reliable, but your, you know, engineering transaction tables are actually quite reliable. Um, maybe you have multiple points of sale. And so you have purchases coming in from different sources. So basically, the paradigm is get everything into one place so that you can make you know logical choices on how to best model your data. And you're saying that that one place that is like high level enough can be accessible by people who are not just on the data team. It, it should be made to be so. You know, SQL ends up being the lingua franca of you know ending up with a high quality data store, but um, a lot of companies will get started by just kind of using the raw data and pulling it. You know, like the engineers, if they were pulling purchases, they would just do it off Postgres or something like that. The benefit with Snowflake is that, you know, your PM may or may not have access to a Postgres table, but Snowflake can be given broad access to for pulling things. Yeah. You know, one one trend, and thank you for clarifying, because um, I appreciate those type of specific answers. Like we hear so much, so many options. And then I think putting yeah. this into layers, it helps inform that decision. Um, one of the trends, it's everyone's talking about AI and chat GPT and how yeah. AI is going to change the world. We've been hearing it for, for quite some time already. Um, how are you thinking about really using AI and other technologies to get to insights faster, to not just present the data, but help person make a decision with that data? Yeah, let's see. If you're trying to say, I want to uncover insights to like, you know, how to best improve my product with AI. Um, I'll say I haven't seen it yet with the chat GPT or AI, you know, that, that level of meta analysis, I've seen kind of more shallow queries being done quite readily. Or if you want to like author a blog post or something like that, um, you can, you can use chat GPT to do things like, you know, how do I query this type of data? And then it'll give you some sort of example, but it's usually not something to, to completely operate on. You know, the, the thing with data is that w for, the more consequential the decision, the more precise and clean your data has to be. You know, if you are just making some sort of directional call, it's like, okay, plus or minus, whatever, it's fine if it's like 10, 20% off. If you're making calls on like, should I launch this product or decommission the code and undo the last month of work, which is basically the call you're making with like an AB experiment, then you kind of want the right answer. You know, you, you, you want to make sure you're making the right call. Yeah, it reminded me of what you said first about do you trust your data? Yeah, that, that's a big part. It's a big part. You know, if, if you want data to be part of, of the decision process, you have to first trust it. So kind of shifting gears a little bit into to your, your team and then how you grew your company. Can you give me an, an idea of uh, how big you guys are using any, any metrics that you feel comfortable with? Yeah, I mean, we're we're around twenty or so odd people. You know, a bunch of data practitioners from you know across the industry. You know, my, again, my former career, Airbnb. You know, we have Snowflake, Uber, Stitch Fix, Pinterest, DNA, and in, in here, so quite a lot of different uh, experiment uh, capabilities. I would say some places that we we tend to really spike on is one, data engineering, because experimentation 
is one of the more intense uh, data engineering applications out there. That's usually what people find when they start building this in-house. Um, and the other is design. Because again, if you want trust, if you want people to make consequential decisions on things, then it has to be really clear what's going on. You know, you need to not only feel empowered yourself to understand what you're saying, but you need to have the tools to story tell to your org. So, you know, I, I think those are two places where I take a particular pride in the quality of our team. And Che, for you personally, how have you evolved as a CEO? You can imagine when you were in a smaller company yeah. uh, to today where there's more data people and designers and others helping yeah. you realize your vision. Completely. Well, the first thing is just actually making your vision and strategy really concrete. You know, I, I think a big part of what the CEO needs to do is set the direction of the company and, you know, say, like, what are things that we will be doing? What are things we won't be doing? Um, and especially in the next quarter, two or three, like, what is the very particular focus that underlies the strategy? You know, painting like a really clear picture of like, where does the company need to go? You know, you can do this in collaboration with your executives and others. Um, and then the next stage would be making sure you have the right team to execute that strategy. You know, like hiring the appropriate people. Once you have the people, making sure they're in the right positions, they're unlocked, so they can, you know, operate really fluidly. Um, and then from there, like, you know, so much of culture stems down from the CEO. So also making sure you're extremely intentional on the culture you set. Well, I come from a technical background as well. And uh, I, speaking from experience, you know, it, the, Talking of strategy, culture, recruiting, it's not something that came naturally. Uh, so I'm just yeah. curious to know how were you able to acquire those skills while also probably letting go some of your data skills to empower your data team to also grow? Yeah, I mean, I have always found that as a CEO and founder, I learned the most from other founders. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a nice cohort of kind of contemporary founders and also people who are much further ahead uh, who I can constantly learn from. But... Honestly, a lot of it, you're also just learning with your team. You know, you're all in it together. You're all in the thick of it, you know, working through problems together. And, you know, everyone's got a job to do. Uh, some are kind of directly building the product. Some are selling it. Uh, you know, as a CEO, you have to take stock of like, as everyone's kind of doing their jobs, does the whole add up to more than the sum of its parts? And if not, then what's missing? What, you know, is there some process? Is there some direction? Is there something else to add? Uh, how is your product team structured? We structure our product team on the life cycle of, of experiments. So, you know, every experiment, you know, starts from some leadership mandate on like, what are the priorities for the business? You know, is it growth? Is it profitability? Is there something, is there some other strategic outcome? From there, that translates into metrics. And from there, product teams need to come up with ideas for how to drive those metrics. You know, there's sort of a, a planning and setup stage. Um, from there, you give birth to certain experiments, you set them out in the wild, got to make sure that they run properly, uh, that they execute as you expect them to. There's no issues that arise along the way. And then you make decisions and you evangelize those decisions. So kind of each step of the life cycle um, is something that we've organized teams around to make sure those moments are always highly trusted, always appropriately collaborative. Um, and, you know, in the end, they lead to EPO champions getting promoted. You know, I always say like our ultimate success criteria is that the teams using EPO are rising up within the organizations. They're always seen as reliable. They're, they always seem to know what's going on. And, you know, the org just really wants to put more power into their hands. Um, I, I love asking this question to what I call product CEO. So people who, who come from a building background who understand what it is to get something done. At the same time, we were talking before uh, that company is bigger than product. Product is a huge component and at the very beginning of the stage of a company, probably it's it's everything in all or almost everything. But for you now, where obviously you have a strong product and a strong product team, you also have other things to take care of. Like how do you structure your team day to day or week to week? Like where do you put your most of your energy these days? Of my personal energy? Yeah. Yeah. I think a big thing is to say like, you know, of this of the different initiatives going on, which are the ones that need further investigation, correction, you know, effort added, you know, perhaps like the, the org is a little bit unevenly bent towards one side and you know, you're going to have to make a staffing decision on this place. And so you get your hands dirty in it and start doing the operating just to get a feel for who do you need to actually be in there. Um, sometimes you get a sense that a certain, you know, 
piece, whether it's sales or marketing or product or end or whatever, is um, you know having trouble working through some blockers. And so you can kind of get in there and again, get a feel for how it's going, working with your executive there, of course, in parallel. Um, and then other times you might have a strategic decision to make. And so there's not some like direct doing to happen, but you want to work with that executive and you know actually go through this decision together. So, you know, how I decide to personally spend my time, there's a mixture of reasons why I might focus on marketing or sales or product. But the most important thing is that it's done intentionally, right? That you start out the week and you look at your calendar and you say, you know, what are my priorities? And then does my calendar match my priorities? Yeah. And you mentioned um, recruiting and uh, having a strong executive team a few times. So I want to double click on it because yeah. I agree. Uh, the only way I feel personally save moving on to different areas is, is is by trusting a team and i know yeah how hard uh-huh. it is to find these type of people so how what's your phil- philosophy around hiding yeah I, I would say the there's the big thing especially with an executive team is you have to trust them you know you have to like really you know these are the people essentially taking care of your kid right you have to feel very good about kind of putting this set of work on in their hands and so that requires one just doing the proper research and you know talking with other people of you know hire these executives thinking it's your own experience to actually intentionally lay out what sort of background you want the other is to just psychologically unpack yourself as a ceo and just kind of convey to someone like what do i want to see from you to make sure i trust you you know, just to make sure that, like, when I delegate work to you, that, you know, I'm not going to be helicoptering over you or anything like that. So it, when you make tr- the outcome of trust a kind of first order goal, then it, it sort of becomes like, okay, you need to look within yourself, you need to look within the function, you need to learn whatever, like, what does it take to get there? Uh, what, what sort of handshake agreement can you make with your executive to make sure you get there? And then once you have that initial trust, then it's around aligning on outcomes and to say, you know, what do I expect to see from this practice? Um, such that if you, you know, hit these out- milestones, these outcomes, then, you know, you get broad deference, you get empowered, you know, celebrated. Um, and if you don't hit those outcomes, you know, what else would you want to see? So I, I think that a big thing as CEO is that you just really, you can't have a bunch of criteria or evaluations in your head. You need to just get it on paper. You need to get it really clear and transparent. That's the, I'm smiling because that's a part that data can help, but sometimes it's not enough, right? And the interpersonal dynamics and, and really making sure there's a strong commitment and trust, um, it's, it's, it's critical, at least in, in my experience as well. Um, and obviously, as someone who comes from a data background, who's building a data product, uh, I can imagine you guys drink your own champagne and uh, leverage some of uh, EPO internally. Yeah, 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 completely. You know, we've set up some experiments here and there. We use our own feature flagging. <laughs> uh, and I think beyond just literal A-B experiments, we just believe in running experiments, right? You know, the idea that, like, let's just try it out and kind of look for some signals that it's working or not. You know, even if they're qualitative signals or whatever. Like, you know, as a culture, we just really embrace the idea that, like, if you have some idea and you want to try it out, go try it out. T- tell me more about that because I obviously I, I believe in that and I heard from other CEOs how important it is. The counter is um, there is not enough psychological safety. What's going to happen if that experiment actually doesn't work? You know, because from and so I want to know more about how you are able to create those conditions for people to feel empowered to actually try things. Yeah, completely. You know, I, I, I think a lot about the Jeff Bezos framework, the like type one, type two decisions. If you've heard that, you know, basically there are a bunch of decisions basically every decision is reversible or irreversible, right? Uh, Reversible decisions are like, okay, you did this thing, you decided it wasn't good and you just decided to go the other direction completely. Does it actually matter? You know, like if you change your mind on this decision, is it something you can take back? And if it's the case that you can take back the decision, it's reversible. You know, you can, you can start doing this other process instead of this process. You can do, do this other, you know, workflow instead of this workflow. Um, you should just try it out, right? Like there's, uh, if the cost of making the wrong decision isn't that high, you should just try it out. Alternatively, there are other decisions which are kind of closer to one-way doors. You know, once you go down this route, it's actually very, very messy to undo. And that's where you actually have to align and 
treat the decision a little bit more seriously. And you know, you may run, you still may run an experiment just to de-risk it, but it's going to be something that's much more intentional. You know, you're probably going to write a one pager. You're probably going to, you know, do a pre-mortem, that sort of thing. But the vast majority of decisions are actually reversible. Uh, so what's next for you? What's that uh, vision for for Apple? Yeah, I think a big a big thing we we want to do is you know we're not just selling experimentation infrastructure. We're trying to sell an experimentation culture. You know, we, for all of our companies, we want to make sure that you know everyone in those company is in those companies are able to test out ideas, show impact. You know. Um, be able to show ideas are good without having to win political processes. And so for that, you know, one starting point is to just say, let's make Epo intensely collaborative so that, um, you know, decisions big and small, you can kind of all get together, make those decisions, make those decisions kind of document it, turn it into something that's knowledge generating. Um, and then the other part of it is to just increase the scope of the type of decisions that are being made with Epo. You know, there's a lot of things that are not just AB experiments that, um, you know, still have that shape that you should be able to try them out and see how it goes. So I, I don't want to say too much more until we roll it out, but I'll just tease that, you know, the idea that we're trying to change a culture and that involves, you know, bringing much more people into a collaborative decision-making framework and handling a lot more types of decisions is very much on our radar. Well, Che, I really enjoy uh, chatting and learning from you. Thanks so much for your time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Carlos.